At Mach 3, the sky becomes a furnace. Most wings would melt, twist, or shatter. That's why they made the Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-25. Not elegant, not lightweight, but built to survive what no other jet could. They were slabs of stainless steel, welded, hammered, and forged to survive the extremes of near hypersonic flight. Let's have a look at the process. Soviet engineers were told to build a jet that could outrun an SR-71. That meant designing wings for a machine that would cruise at three times the speed of sound, climb like a rocket, and stay intact through it all. Standard aircraft materials like aluminum were immediately off the table. At three times the speed of sound, the aircraft's skin could reach temperatures beyond 572 degrees Fahrenheit. Aluminum would soften like butter. Titanium? Perfect in theory. But Soviet industry in the 1960s couldn't mass-produce large titanium structures quickly or affordably. The solution? Welded stainless steel. Not elegant, not lightweight, just weapons-grade slabs of steel built to survive. They used VNS-2 and VNS-5 nickel-steel alloys that could handle the heat and still be shaped using standard industrial tools. That meant mass production, simple repairs at remote air bases, and battlefield durability. The downside? Weight. These wings were heavy, but still got a 20-ton interceptor to 65,000 feet. Early designs warped under thermal stress, so engineers adjusted panel thickness and rib spacing to let them flex just enough. Once stainless steel was chosen, the next hurdle was shaping it into wings that could slice through the sky at over 3,000 kilometers per hour. But this wasn't like working with aluminum or even titanium. Steel is heavy, stiff, and completely unforgiving. You can't just press it into shape, you have to fight it. Soviet engineers began with thick industrial-grade steel plates, which were heated and forged under massive rollers. The goal was to create large curved sheets that matched the MiG-25's 42-degree wing sweep with a razor-sharp leading edge to cut drag. But here's the problem. Steel warps when it's welded, and these wings weren't single pieces. Like most aircraft, the MiG-25's wings were built from hundreds of individual ribs, spars, and skin panels. But welding these components brought extreme heat distortion. Every part had to be pre-shaped to account for how it would deform as it cooled. That meant compensating mathematically for future stress before the first weld was even made. Precision jigs the size of freight cars held the pieces in place during spot welding. Each weld was x-rayed because at Mach 3, a tiny hidden crack could be fatal. With the wing skeleton and skin panels in place, it was time to bring it all together, to turn individual steel parts into a structure strong enough to withstand the violence of hypersonic flight. But welding a wing like this isn't easy especially when the result needs to handle air friction that heats the surface at thermal extremes. At that speed, imperfect welds don't just fail, they explode. Every seam had to be flawless. The Soviets used arc welding, where an electric current melts the steel at the joint. But this wasn't mindless factory work. It was more like surgery. Each welder had to complete hundreds of training joints and pass strict quality tests. Every weld was traceable back to the person who made it. If it cracked, the Air Force knew exactly who was responsible. After welding, joints were x-rayed, stress-tested, and sometimes even frozen or reheated to mimic flight conditions. If a seam passed all that, it earned a place on the aircraft. This was combat preparation because a single invisible flaw could tear the wing apart at 90,000 feet. Here's a question for you. What would you call a wing that leaks fuel on the ground, but seals itself at Mach 3? Drop your best one below, we'll pin the winner! Wings for a Mach 3 jet are aerodynamic weapons. The MiG-25's wings had to minimize drag, handle brutal heat, and still generate enough lift to carry a missile-loaded aircraft to the edge of space. So, engineers gave them a thin, flat profile with sharp leading edges to cut through the air. But that thinness came at a cost. Less internal space for fuel or complex systems. Soviet designers made the trade. Speed over fuel capacity. The wings were swept back at about 42.5 degrees. That angle wasn't for looks. It delayed the onset of shockwaves and let the plane push deeper into supersonic speeds without hitting a drag wall. But sculpting those curves from hardened stainless steel wasn't easy. Enormous hydraulic presses exerting hundreds of tons of force shaped the panels. Every contour was measured by laser to ensure it matched aerodynamic specs down to the millimeter. One wrong curve could ruin the whole aircraft. 
Did you know? During long flights, MiG-25 wings expanded enough to visibly change shape in midair, a feature engineers designed on purpose. On the ground, the panels looked slightly off. Only at Mach 3 did they settle into their final aerodynamic form. Inside the MiG-25's wing was a hardened skeleton designed to withstand punishing speeds and brutal G-forces. At the heart of this structure was a torsion box, a closed, load-bearing chamber formed by thick spars and ribs. Its job was to resist twisting and bending during extreme maneuvers, especially when the aircraft pulled tight turns at high altitude and high speed. Assembly required absolute precision. Each rib and spar had to align perfectly with the wing's aerodynamic profile, so Soviet engineers used full-length metal jigs to lock parts into place during installation. Even a hairline misalignment could destabilize airflow or weaken the structure under G-force stress. To save weight, the internal volume of the wings doubled as fuel storage. But there were no fuel bladders here. Instead, the internal cavities were sealed, turning the structure itself into a tank. That meant any imperfection, especially at weld points, risked leakage or even fire. Every joint inside the wing was inspected, sealed, and pressure tested, because at Mach 3, even a pinhole could become a disaster. The leading edge of the MiG-25's wing took the worst of everything. At Mach 3, it hit the air first and faced temperatures over 572 degrees Fahrenheit. Aluminum would melt, titanium could crack, so the Soviets turned to high-strength stainless steel, tough, heat-resistant, and heavy. To cut weight, they made the edge hollow and reinforced it with a honeycomb structure inside. Shaping it wasn't easy. Thick steel had to be pressed into a razor-sharp curve, then finished by hand using grinding tools. Even the smallest flaw could cause drag or instability. The final step was polishing. At these speeds, smoothness matters. A single rough patch could disrupt airflow. Every inch of that leading edge had to be perfect. With the MiG-25's wing structure complete, it still needed one critical element, control. Without moving surfaces, the jet would be nothing more than a missile. To steer at over 2,000 miles per hour, engineers equipped the wings with ailerons, flaps, and hydraulic actuators, tough enough to survive extreme heat and G-forces. The ailerons, mounted near the trailing edge, were built from heat-resistant alloys and attached using oversized titanium brackets. Inside the wing, powerful hydraulic actuators served as mechanical muscles, able to respond instantly even when the skin was scorching hot. Each part was tested on its own, then as a full system under simulated flight conditions. At Mach 3, even a tiny delay could send the aircraft into a deadly spin. These controls weren't just precise, they were survival systems, built to respond faster than disaster. The Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-25 wings reflect a ruthless design brief. Intercept bombers and reconnaissance jets above 65,000 feet at Mach 3 and produce them in large numbers. This was more about survival. The United States was flying spy planes like the SR-71 Blackbird, too fast and too high for any Soviet missile to catch. The only way to stop them was to go faster. Soviet industrial capacity seldom allowed for titanium-intensive construction, so welded stainless steel was the only viable path. It allowed quick production, easy field maintenance, and resilience under thermal duress. The massive Tumansky R-15 engines delivered raw thrust. The steel wings provided heat resistance. Not refined, just formidable. Those were the wings of the Foxbat, steel slabs that leaked fuel on the ground, shuddered at altitude, and still broke records. They weighed over a ton, hauled missiles at Mach 3, and could be patched up on a dirt airfield. No other wing flew higher with more raw intent. They proved that impressive engineering, smart materials, and battlefield practicality could outperform elegance when it mattered most. Even Western designers took notes. Which part of the MiG-25 should we explore next? The massive air intakes or the Tumansky R-15 engines? Let us know in the comments. Push a helicopter past 200 miles an hour and it starts to fight you. The blades stall. The cockpit shakes. The entire machine wants to tear itself apart. For decades, that was the unbreakable limit, until Sikorsky decided to cheat physics. So, how did Sikorsky make a helicopter fly faster than anyone thought possible? In the mid-2000s, Sikorsky set out to break a barrier that had held helicopters back for decades. Most rotorcraft could barely reach 200 miles per hour before they ran into serious problems. 
At those speeds, the retreating blades stalled and vibrations became violent. The tail rotor struggled to maintain control. But speed was not just about breaking records. A faster helicopter could save lives by reaching rescue sites sooner, move troops or supplies across great distances in minutes, and outrun threats that slower aircraft could not escape. To solve this, Sikorsky decided to build a technology demonstrator focused on one clear goal, flying at 250 knots in level flight. To do that, they would need to rethink everything about how a helicopter works. Lift, thrust, and stability all had to be redesigned. It would need to hover like a Blackhawk, but when called on, sprint like a jet. So, they created the Sikorsky X-2. The first key to the X-2's success was its coaxial rotor system. Instead of a single main rotor, it uses two sets of rigid composite blades stacked on the same mast, spinning in opposite directions. By rotating against each other, they cancel out torque automatically. That means the X-2 does not need a traditional sideways tail rotor to keep the helicopter stable. This design also solves one of the biggest problems in high-speed helicopters, known as retreating blade stall. In a normal rotor, the blade moving backward relative to the air produces less lift, which causes instability. With coaxial rotors, there is always an advancing blade on each side of the aircraft, so lift stays balanced even at very high speeds. The blades themselves are rigid composites that hold their exact shape under extreme stress. They resist bending and flapping, letting the X-2 fly smoothly beyond 200 knots, without the wobble and vibration that cripple older designs. Before we move on, here's a question for Sikorsky X-2 lovers. When did X-2 make its very first hover flight? Comment your guesses and we will reveal the answer in origin section. Look at the tail of the X-2 and you will not see a normal tail rotor. Instead, there is a six-bladed pusher propeller. At low speeds, the main rotors do all the work, providing both lift and forward movement, just like a typical helicopter. But as the pilot begins to accelerate, something very clever happens. The main rotors slow down slightly to reduce drag and prevent their tips from creating shock waves. At the same time, more power is directed to the pusher propeller at the rear. Once this happens, the pusher propeller takes over the job of driving the helicopter forward, almost like the propeller on a small airplane. Meanwhile, the main rotors focus only on keeping the aircraft in the air. This smooth shift in how power is used is what allows the X-2 to break through the traditional speed limits of a helicopter and reach levels no standard design can achieve. The Sikorsky X-2 runs on a single LHTECT 800 turboshaft engine that produces about 1800 horsepower. That power does not go to just one part of the helicopter. A gearbox splits it between the coaxial rotors on top and the six-bladed pusher propeller at the rear. When the X-2 is hovering or flying slowly, almost all the power is sent to the rotors because they need to provide both lift and some forward motion. But as the helicopter accelerates and moves into high-speed cruise, most of the power shifts to the pusher propeller. The rotors then slow slightly and focus only on lifting the aircraft. The pilot does not have to manage any of this manually. A digital control system called FADEC, or Full Authority Digital Engine Control, handles it automatically. It adjusts power flow second by second. At the same time, a fly-by-wire system connects the pilot's inputs to three separate flight computers. These computers constantly monitor rotor speed, vibrations, air speed, and the aircraft's altitude. If any unwanted vibration appears, the system cancels it instantly like noise-canceling headphones for the entire helicopter. The X-2 was also shaped to cut drag wherever possible. The rigid composite blades hold their form even under heavy loads. The rotor hubs are compact and covered with smooth aerodynamic fairings. The narrow spacing between the coaxial rotors helps the airflow cleanly between them. Together, these refinements nearly doubled the lift-to-drag ratio compared to a traditional helicopter which is why the X-2 can fly faster and more efficiently than any design before it. The X-2 first flew on August 27, 2008, in a cautious hover over upstate New York. Over the next two years, Sikorsky expanded its flight envelope step by step. By July 2009, the pusher propeller was engaged for the first time. By May 2010, it had already reached 180 knots and continued to climb. On July 26, 2010, the X-2 unofficially broke the long-standing record held by the Westland Lynx since 1986 by flying 225 knots. 
But Sikorsky wasn't finished. On September 15, 2010, test pilot Kevin Bredenbeck leveled off at 250 knots, meeting the exact target. Then he pushed it into a shallow dive and hit 260 knots, about 300 miles per hour, making it the fastest helicopter in the world. That achievement earned Sikorsky the Collier Trophy for the greatest aerospace achievement of the year. Even at record speeds, the X-2 handled like a well-trained scout helicopter. The coaxial rotors stayed balanced in turns. Yaw, where the aircraft moves horizontally, was managed by adjusting the torque between the rotors, and the pusher prop could even apply reverse thrust to brake quickly. Unlike normal helicopters, it didn't need to pitch its nose high to slow down. Visibility stayed forward and level. At cruise speeds above 200 knots, the Sikorsky X-2 behaved more like an airplane than a traditional helicopter. The rotor RPM slowed down, reducing drag and cutting noise to a level you would not expect at such high speed. Inside the cabin, the sound at 200 knots was similar to what you would hear in a normal helicopter flying at half that speed. Vibrations that usually rattle rotorcraft were reduced to a soft hum. During test flights, pilots found that the X-2 could even fly hands-off in level cruise because the onboard computers held it steady. Balanced coaxial rotors, slowed rotor tips, and clean aerodynamic shaping all worked together to make the helicopter remarkably smooth and quiet, even when it was flying faster than any rotorcraft before it. Over its life, the X-2 flew just 23 test flights and logged about 23 hours before retiring in July 2011. It was never designed for service but as a proof of concept, and it succeeded completely. It met its ambitious speed goals and proved that vibration damping, stability, and power sharing could work exactly as planned. After retirement, the X-2 was placed in the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum as a milestone in aviation. Its design lives on in Sikorsky's S-97 Raider and SB-1 Defiant, helicopters that carry the same technology into the future. The X-2 was the spark that proved a helicopter could break its limits without losing its identity. Sikorsky started the X-2 project quietly in the early 2000s using private funding. The design was based on decades of research into coaxial rotors and advanced gearboxes from earlier projects like the RAH-66 Comanche. Engineers improved the shape of the blades, created a compact rotor hub with smooth aerodynamic covers, and added a modern fly-by-wire control system to make it easier to handle. The progress was steady. And remember the question we asked earlier? When did X-2 make its very first hover flight? The answer is 2008. The X-2 made its very first hover flight in 2008. In 2009, it began flying faster. By 2010, it had already broken the world speed record for helicopters. And by 2011, it was retired after proving its point. The X-2 showed that a helicopter could fly like an airplane at high speeds while still keeping the ability to hover and move vertically like any rotorcraft. Now, you know how the world's fastest helicopter was made. Should we next cover the Eurocopter X-Cube Compound Rotorcraft or the Tiltrotor V-22 Osprey? Drop your pick in the comments and hit subscribe so you never miss the next deep dive into aerospace innovation.